Hi, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. As always, happy whatever day it is you're watching this. Welcome to episode 81 of Left Side of the Aisle. Uh, I'm your host, my name is Larry Erickson. For the next half hour or so, I'm going to be your ranter and raconteur. I'm going to be talking about things important to me, I think deserve to be important to you as well. As always, comments, questions, reactions, whatever, can be sent to me directly. My email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And my website is Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and that will be up around here a couple of times during the show. And if you didn't catch the email address, you can get it at the website. Uh, as always, if you send me email, please include something like left side of the aisle or your cable show or something like that so I know it's not spam. Okay, with those all obviously uh, necessary introductions out of the way, let's get to it. Uh, and I said last week I was going to be talking some about the election, though of course I will, everybody else is, so I might as well too. And so just some general observations I wanted to make from my perspective. One is that, uh, I mean, obviously the presidential election, Barack Obama won, uh, and the thing is it actually wasn't as close as was being predicted, which I found interesting. There were nine, they called them battleground, or I think more accurate as toss-up states, where the election was supposedly in doubt. Uh, Obama won seven of those by margins of two to six points, uh, and he's ahead in Florida, although at the point I'm doing this, the vote count isn't finalized yet. Unfortunately, from my perspective, he followed that up with one of the most self-centered victory speeches I have ever heard in my life. He hardly mentioned his supporters and all the people who put work in for him. Uh, he didn't say anything about the gains made by his party in the House and the Senate. Um, the whole speech was about people believing in him. Now, and, but I have to tell you, the truth is, I, I did not want Obama to win, but I did want Romney to lose because I, I wanted, if nothing else, to show that there is some level of lying, some level of blatant lying, which even our electorate will not tolerate. Because the thing about Mitt Romney is that not only is, is he a liar, but unlike Obama, he's not even a good liar. He's a terrible liar. Um, now, a couple of weeks ago, I gave you the reasons why I would not vote for Barack Obama. I stand by all of those reasons, and we're still going to be facing those same issues in a second term. The other thing to mention about this is that um, he won the national vote by something apparently at last numbers I saw as a touch over 2%, which is a clear enough victory. It's not a razor-thin victory like some have been, but it still indicates that we are still a deeply divided nation. And we have to face that. We have to deal with that. Now, there was uh, some good news to be had uh, in the election. Uh, first, Alan West. Apparently, last I heard, he lost. Uh, Joe Walsh lost. Uh, Michelle Bachman barely survived, despite outspending her opponent 12 to 1. So I suspect we're not going to hear much from her either. Um, Alan Grayson won. And if you don't know who any of these people are, look them up and you'll see why I'm glad. Uh, locally, uh, questions one and three won, which I was pleased to see. Uh, I wish question two had won, but um, it didn't. Uh, but um, the vote was close, so closer than actually I expected it to be. So I think that uh, trends well for the future. And on a personal, again, personal feeling, I'm, I'm kind of glad Elizabeth Warren won. Uh, I don't usually get to vote with, for a major party candidate that I feel pretty comfortable voting for, so I'm glad that she won. On the other hand, there was some good news from another place, a uh, place where I've said before it seems to be most of the good news these days comes from, uh, same-sex marriage, clean sweep for same-sex marriage. Uh, in Maine, there was a ballot question looking to undo a referendum that banned same-sex marriage, this legalized same-sex marriage, that one. Uh, in Maryland, there was a, a, leg, a, a bill passed to legalize same-sex marriage, um, and the question is if voters are going to approve of that bill. They did. In Washington, it was the same thing. Do voters approve of a bill passed recognizing same-sex marriages? It passed. And in Minnesota, there was a move for a constitutional amendment to ban same-sex marriages that failed. 
So there's still no same-sex marriage in Minnesota at this point, but, but they did not ban it outright. So basically a 4-0 sweep for, um, for people uh, uh, support of same-sex marriage. But with that, with that quick introduction, a quick overview of some of the things important to me, we're going to move on to our regular weekly feature, the Outrage of the Week. And this does have to do with the elections. Um, the Outrage of the Week is very simple. It's this. And this. And this. And so on, and so on, and so on. It has been said more than once, but it bears repeating, that... If the United States was a third world nation, we would condemn our elector, uh, election systems as terrible, as awful, as a travesty incapable of producing a fair or reliable outcome. Our election system is a disgrace. Uh, it's an utter shameful disgrace. Uh, and you know, this doesn't, uh, uh, this does not have a, a single thing to do with uh, who you want to win. It doesn't have a, thi a thing to do with whether or not you're satisfied with two parties, which I'm not, or whether you believe in third, fourth, and fifth parties to keep the ideas flowing, which I do. It has nothing to do with whether you pulled, in the, lever pulled the lever or filled in the oval or whatever you did for uh, Barack Obama or Mitt Romney or Jill Stein or whoever. Got nothing to do with that. Having to stand in line for six, for seven, for eight hours in order to vote is a disgrace. It is unacceptable. And all those lines I showed you, that was for early voting. This is for what was supposed to make voting easier. This is what was, uh, what was supposed to cut down on those kind of lines. And yet they still exist. I heard last night that some people in Florida were still in line at nearly 2 a.m. local time trying to vote. I, I gotta tell you, th this is more than just unacceptable. This is a threat to the very concept of being able to vote. There are physical limits to what people can do as to how long they can stand on line. There, th it is a threat and again, this has nothing to do with being capitalist or socialist or with being red or blue or green. It has nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with the idea of having a functioning republic. And here, I'm not even talking about the, 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 the bogus claims about voter fraud or these things about these idiot voter ID laws and whatnot that are being passed. Although I do have to mention that the great preponderance of black faces you might have noticed in those photos I told you may give you some idea about why those lines are allowed to exist. But no, I'm not talking about that. I am talking about the normal functioning of our election system. It's riddled with administrative errors, poor record keeping, varying and changing standards and regulations, whether problems with absentee ballots, with registration backlogs, with wrongly calibrated machines, and perhaps worst of all, People being wrongfully and illegally denied the opportunity even to cast a provisional ballot because too often the election officials don't know the laws that they are there to enforce and administer. And what's the answer to this? Well, there are several answers. One would be a standardized registration procedure that does not put unfair and unnecessary burdens on the poor and the elderly. For another, get more voting machines. That would cut down on those lines. Just get more voting machines. Now, obviously, there's more to it than that. But frankly, get more machines is such an obvious answer that I have to really wonder why, it's, why it hasn't been implemented. Although, actually, no, not entirely. I don't wonder because, again, I refer you back to that preponderance of black faces you saw on that line. And some people think it is to their political benefit or just that they think of themselves as so socially superior to others that there are some people they don't want to be able to vote. And uh, I have to say, I have to say, to be, to be honest, that this is an area where one major party is much worse than the other. The Republicans are much worse than the Democrats on this, simply because the Republicans figure that they do better with smaller voter turnouts, and the Democrats think they do better with bigger voter turnouts. So... But, but ignore all that. Ignore all of that. And just go down to the basic system, the basic election system that we have. And the fact is, 
everything from registration to actually casting the ballot to actually counting the ballots is a chaotic mess. And it should be a major source of embarrassment to us as a people. It is an outrage. All right, from there, we're actually going on to our other weekly feature, which also has to do with the election. The election's the theme this week, uh, and that is the Clown Award. Now, Pennsylvania, I've talked about this before, Pennsylvania passed this uh, um, voter ID law. It was a rather strict law. It was approved by a judge. The law was approved by a judge. But a higher court in Pennsylvania basically ordered that judge to enjoin the law to block its enforcement uh, until after the election when the full case could be heard. But the state, in the wake of this order, uh, failed to inform voters of the change. They delayed sending out corrected information and instead issued new and still misleading ads like this one. This is a, you know, on the side of a bus. This ad, this was after the order. The ad features the, a big picture of a photo ID with little type that says on election day if you have it and then in great big huge type, show it. Well, voting advocacy groups went back to court in Pennsylvania uh, to ask that the state be ordered to stop sending out these clearly misleading ads. On the Friday before election day, a judge in Pennsylvania refused to issue that order allowing the misleading ads to continue. The judge who did that was Commonwealth Judge Robert Simpson. This is the man who originally approved of this law and who, as I've told you before, after being ordered to enjoin it, went out of his way to make that order as limited as possible and specifically allowed the state of Pennsylvania to continue producing and issuing misleading ads. Commonwealth Judge Robert Simpson, you are a clown. And we are going to take a break. And we're back. Now, for the rest of the show, it's going to be you know, a little more personal than I usually get. But uh, last week's show uh, was recorded. Actually, I, I was away for a week. My wife and I were at a conference, and uh, so I was away. So last week's show was actually recorded before I left. So it couldn't talk at all about Sandy because that was after the show was recorded. Um, as for us, I'll, I'll tell you, in case anybody's wondering, why well, you should be, I don't know, but just in case you are, uh, we really, really did fine. We sort of got stranded for a couple of days. Um, we, uh, it took us an extra couple of days to get home, but uh, we got home uh, rather lighter in the wallet. But uh, still, we got home. And uh, when we got home, we discovered there was no real damage to speak of. There were some branches down in the area. Um, one of our neighbors apparently lost some siding from their house. And the, apparently the power was off, but only for a few hours. So basically, no real damage to speak of. We, around here, we lucked out again. Others weren't so lucky. Of course, after Sandy raked across the Caribbean, went up the East Coast, and what got the most coverage, of course, because it was the most unusual, was the impact it had on the New York metropolitan area. Um, I have family down in New Jersey, and uh, some of them reported that uh, they had flooding in their houses. Um, people said they lost their cars in the flood. They were ruined, destroyed in the flood. My brother who lives in North Jersey. Uh, he was without power for a week, I think actually yesterday, as of yesterday, which would be election day, I think he was still without power. Um, you also know about um, the, uh, the flooding, 14-foot storm surge in Manhattan, the flooding in New York City. Um, you probably heard about the, the, how the storm caused a fire in the Breezy Point section of Queens, and the wind whipped that fire, and the whole neighborhood was burnt to the ground as a result of the storm. You know about the millions without power or gasoline or heat. Um, uh, you know the people were stranded. Uh, some people were stranded running out of food. People on Staten Island apparently stranded in that way. And now you may have also heard that um, they just got a blizzard there in central, south central New Jersey with three to six inches of snow across the region. You know. The thing is, but part of the devastation of Sandy, and with, um, well, over 100 people dead 
and an estimate of more than $50 billion in property damage. I think devastation is the right word. Part of the devastation of Sandy hit me in a more personal and more visceral, if you will, way. See, I grew up on the Jersey Shore. I grew up there. I was born there. I grew up there. I lived a long time there. Um, it was home, and um, in fact, it, it um, still feels like home in a lot of ways. It's the place where my memories lie. And seeing some of the coverage was kind of hard. Uh, bring up that first picture there. Um, this is Ocean Grove, Ocean Grove, New Jersey. I have walked the length of that boardwalk. I know exactly where those houses are. I know how far it is from there to the nearest frozen custard stand. This next one, this bridge, this bridge, this is in Mantaloking. This, I've been over that bridge. That's a, it's actually a very pretty bridge. It, it, it was over an inlet. Mantaloking, you see there, is actually a barrier beach. And this bridge, this very pretty bridge, linked Mantaloking with the mainland of New Jersey. A little further down that same barrier beach, uh, a family of a friend had a, um, had a summer cottage there. And we used to go down there. We used to spend time down there. We used to cruise this section, this section of Route 35 in Ortley Beach, New Jersey. We used to cruise that section of road. And just like John Cougar said, we were just ch uh, sucking on chili dogs and shooting the summer breeze. Uh, it was actually somewhere around here. It was a little bit north of here, in fact. Uh, but somewhere right around there where uh, we got stopped by a local cop because we had long hair. And we were basically told to get out of town. It's part of the Great Ortley Beach Massacre, if, which if somebody really wants to be bored by somebody's old stories, I'll, I'll tell them about sometime. But come summer, come summer, Seaside Heights was the place. Seaside Heights, this was the second home for a lot of people, um, even who lived on the shore. Now, there were boardwalks and rides and games all along the shore, but unless you're going to go all the way down to Wildwood, Seaside was the big place. If you wanted to drown yourself in cotton candy and candy apples, if you wanted to be surrounded by the blare of boom boxes and the flashing of yellow and red neon lights, if you wanted to be uh, hear the noise, the clickety noise of game wheels or the whoosh of tilt whirls Seaside is where you went. This is Seaside now. It's estimated that in Seaside, 90% of the structures are either destroyed or damaged. And what you see in the middle background of that picture is this. Bring up that next one. Uh, is this. It's a roller coaster. The pier that that roller coaster, and I used to ride that roller coaster, the pier that it's on is now gone. But the one that I think that got me the most was this. This, this next one. This is Seabright, Seabright, New Jersey. It's the main street of Seabright, New Jersey. I have been on that street. I have driven that street more times than I can remember. Uh, a few years ago, when, uh, when uh, my wife wanted to see where I grew up and we went down to New Jersey, this is one of the places that I wanted to make sure I took her. Now, Seabright's easy to find in a map of New Jersey. Just look at a map of New Jersey. Seabright is this narrow strip of land where Sandy Hook meets the mainland. Um, it's, uh, on one side of Seabright, there is ocean. On the other side, there's an inlet that opens into two rivers. Now, if you look at this picture, you're looking north in this picture, and just beyond the frame, just beyond as far as you can see at the picture, there is a bridge that goes over that inlet, while the street that you're on, Ocean Avenue, continues up towards Sandy Hook. And if you go up past that bridge, a little ways up, there is a seawall, just a, a big stone and concrete structure about 12 or 15 feet high along the road there. And beyond the other side of that seawall, there is ocean. There's no beach. It's all washed away. And one of the things to do, when we had a good, really good, decent nor'easter, one of the things to do was to go down to Seabright, go down along the road, it's called Ocean Avenue, go down along that road and watch the waves wash over the seawall onto the road. And the thing is, where there isn't seawall along there, and to the right of the picture where you are, and somewhat to the south of it, where there isn't seawall, there's beach, and there are beach clubs. So because of the position, I knew Seabright was in trouble when that storm was headed that way. I knew Seabright was in trouble. The thing is, the sand from those beach clubs isn't on the beach anymore. This last picture. 
The woman in that picture, who, by the way, is, is the um, Mayor Seabright, she is not walking along sand dunes. She is walking down Ocean Avenue. This, the beach from Seabright has been moved into the middle of town. Now, I've been showing this. Well, I started to say not out of nostalgia, but I suppose to some degree it is a kind of nostalgia. But what I really wanted to do, this is kind of, if you will, I wanted to do an, uh, an RIP for the home of my memories. Because someone wrote, uh, just, just, just the other day, someone wrote that, says, the Jersey Shore, it's not a physical location. Or it's not just a physical location. It's not just a resort area. The Jersey Shore is a brand. It's a lifestyle. It's a way of thinking. It's a way of being. And, and, and which, by the way, has absolutely nothing to do with that idiotic TV show. I don't know of a single person who actually grew up on the shore who does not despise that show. But the Jersey Shore was, it's an attitude. It is what it is. It's a way of being. And now it's gone. It's gone. Um, the Jersey Shore I knew was gone. Oh, it'll be rebuilt. There's no question. It'll be rebuilt. There'll be houses that go back up. There'll be amusement things that go back up. But it won't be the same. It'll be new. It'll be shiny. It'll be glitzy. It'll probably be upscale. The Jersey Shore will be there, but it won't be the Jersey Shore anymore. The home of my memories is gone. And I just wanted to have the chance to say RIP. But there's a question, getting back to more direct things, there's a question about why I would indulge myself this way. Why would I indulge myself in such a personal kind of thing here? Well, that's because people have raised the question of, is there a connection between Sandy and global warming? Don't be an idiot. Of course there is. No, 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 no. All right, no. We, you can't say as absolute scientific fact that global warming caused Sandy. In fact, global warming never causes a storm. Uh, local atmospheric conditions cause, cause storms. And if somebody says, well, could you have had a storm like Sandy without global warming? Hypothetically, yes, you could have. Yes, of course, that's, you know, that's true. But the thing is, to deny a connection between storms like Sandy and global warming, to deny that connection because you can't prove that Sandy in particular was caused by global warming, is exactly, it is exactly like the people who try to deny a connection between smoking and disease because you couldn't prove that a particular individual case of cancer was caused by smoking. Oh, that person goes, well, you know, they could have gotten cancer without, even if they didn't smoke. So therefore, you can't show a connection between smoking and heart disease. Now, that is utter nonsense, and I, everybody agrees now that it's utter nonsense. There is a clear statistical connection between smoking and disease. A clear statistical connection. Uh, you can, uh, uh, you know, if you smoke... You are more likely to get heart disease, you're more likely to get emphysema, you're more likely to get lung cancer, and the more and the longer you smoke, the more likely you are to get at least one of those. There is a clear statistical connection. No one denies that connection. In that same way, you cannot deny the connection between Sandy and global warming. And yes, 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 the world is warming. There simply is no question about this. Bring up that graph. Temp 1, it's called. Bring that up. Bring that up. Uh, this shows temperature records from the last 30 years from five different agencies, and they're all showing dramatic increases. You know, there's some variation. There's some variation, but they're all showing dramatic increases over that time, okay? Um, and just so you know, just so you know who these agencies are, like, not just a bunch of letters, okay? I'm going to tell you. The NCDC is the National Climatic Data Center. It's part of NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. GISS is the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. It's part of NASA. CRU is the Climate Research Center of the University of East Anglia in England. RSS is Remote Sensing Systems. This is a private corporation in Santa Rosa, California that gathers satellite data. 
And UAH is the Global Hydrology and Climate Center of the University of Alabama at Huntsville. So we've got two government agencies, a private corporation, and two universities, all of them saying the same thing. You want more? One more. Bring up, bring up uh, graph temp two. Now, this shows actually four different agencies. Three of them repeats from the one before. It also adds Berkeley. That's the Berkeley group. This was a group of physicists out at Berkeley, uh, at the uh, UCAL Berkeley, who didn't believe global warming, and they were going to re-examine all the data to find the truth of it, and instead of uh, 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 challenging the data, wound up confirming it. So now you've got like six different agencies, government, private business, universities, outside groups, all saying the same thing. Yes, the world is warming. There simply is no question about this. And the fact is, the warm, a warming climate puts more energy into storms. This is simply a physical fact. Uh, and that includes hurricanes. These storms have more rain. They'll have stronger winds, uh, which means they'll push more of a storm surge, which increases flooding, which will be even worse because with the warming of the world, the ocean gets most of that heat. Ocean levels have been rising, so the storm surge is on top of a higher base. We know that climate change makes things like Sandy more frequent. So can you say climate change caused Sandy? No, but what you can say is that climate change makes things like Sandy far more likely to happen. And it also makes them more severe when they do happen. Um, the thing is, the extreme weather we've seen over the past couple of decades is exactly what you expect to see with global warming. It's exactly what you expect to see. And it's, and it's not just Sandy. We are on track this year to have the hottest year in the United States in recorded weather history. In fact, in August, a nuclear power plant in Connecticut had to be shut down for two weeks because the cooling water it was draw drawing from Long Island Sound was too warm to effectively cool the reactor. And it's not just us. The decade from 20, uh, 2001 to 2010 worldwide was the warmest on record. It beat the record set by the 1990s, which beat the record set by the 1980s. The years 2010 and 2005 are tied for worldwide the warmest years ever recorded. Meanwhile, back home, we've had one of the most crippling droughts in our recent history, one of the worst wildfire years in history, while at the same time, some parts of the country, the Pacific Northwest, the, the uh, 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 upper New England, uh, the, Cal uh, the, um, the Florida coast, were actually a lot wetter than normal. The simple fact is that the models all say the same thing. Global warming produces more storms like Sandy, and when they come, they will be worse. We are past the point of saying, does global warming exist? We are now to the point of saying, what are we going to do to prevent the worst aspects? Because we can't even prevent it from happening. It's too late. And with that cheery thought, I'm going to leave you for the week. And maybe we'll talk about that a little bit more about this next week. We'll see. But for now... You have the best week you can, <laughs> and uh, we'll see you next week.